Um, so I, as I said, not the idea here is not to not to make this a um, uh, not turn spine surgery into a business, but to think about some of the skills that um, uh, leaders will develop that are going to be important for uh, surgeons moving forward, and to turn a little bit of a different lens to how we um, how we think about managing complications in spine tumor surgery. Um, I have one disclosure, and that's I'm a co-founder and board member of Nomad Health. It's not relevant to uh, to the discussion today. Uh, our learning objectives for the next uh, 15 minutes or so is to appreciate um, how a detailed surgical plan is critical to avoiding complications, uh, to describe how an interdisciplinary approach can minimize uh, additional uh, risks found in spine surgery, and to summarize how relying on um, patterns and processes can effectively minimize unintended errors uh, and complications. So a couple of principles uh, just to keep in mind as we walk through um, uh, our talk today. Uh, uh, one, uh, that anticipation is a critical skill to develop um, in avoiding complications before they ever happen. Uh, uh, two, that approaching with a team-based approach uh, is becoming increasingly important given the variety of uh, technology and and other kinds of um, uh, other kinds of um, uh, uh, technology that we're using uh, in the operating room today. And three, that uh, a focus on processes and not necessarily re relying on individual people uh, can help us to avoid uh, complications. Um, remember, though, uh, no one is perfect, and spine surgery, especially this kind of spine surgery, is going to be fraught with complications. And perhaps the best thing that can be done before um, before embarking on a spine surgery with a patient is to make sure to set expectations up front as clearly as possible. The definition of patient satisfaction is the delta between expectation and delivery. If expectations are very high and delivery is high, but not as high as expectations, the patient will remain unsatisfied. But if we as surgeons, as those who have seen this movie be before, so to speak, can mitigate what those expectations are, make realistic expectations for the patient, and then deliver beyond those, uh, we will um, we will find more satisfied patients in the in the long run and uh, avoid those uh, difficult conversations. So setting expectations is a is a critical part of um, of managing potential complications because we'll we'll engage our better, our patients better if they feel as though they've gone in with their eyes open. Um, so as I mentioned, I, I think spine tumor surgery is a setup for complications. Um, it. it it has to do with a host of factors, some having to do with the patients themselves, other having to do with the complexity of what we're doing to them. But just to call a few out, um, you know, many of these patients are gonna be elderly. They often have um, a compromised immune system and a compromised immune status. Uh, some will be um, cachectic, uh, have, um, have poor nutritional status. Uh, we're talking about fields that we're operating on that may have been radiated or going to be radiated shortly, leading to wound healing problems. Uh, coagulopathy is a common uh, issue. Um, we're unlikely to obtain fusion in almost any of these uh, surgeries due to poor bone quality and high risk of uh, hardware failure. Um, there's a complex interdisciplinary team that we have to manage. Um, there's a high variability in how these patients present. Uh, to the operating rooms, to um, to the hospital before we plan surgery. Uh, there's variation in the teams that we work with. Many times we're talking about doing cases like this off hours, and um, the teams may not be as uh, comfortable with the types of surgeries we're doing or the technology that we need uh, in order to get the get the case done. And as I mentioned already a couple of times, we have an increasingly complex environment to manage. And that's both the technology we're using, but also the number of people and the number of subspecialized people who exist in the operating room. So you put all this together and this is a this is a setup for complications. Mm -hmm. And to turn a little bit of a different lens to this, I'd just like to um, introduce you to this uh, Perot diagram here. Um, this was published in the late 90s. It's, um, it helps us to describe and understand normal accident theory and the kinds of environments where failures or complications in our language typically occur. Uh, this on one axis here uh, describes how tightly coupled a process is. That is how interdependent each step is on the next one. And on the other axis, the complexity 
of the interactions of those of those processes. And so you can see a whole bunch of different categories, businesses, environments that are listed um, on this two by two matrix. And in the upper right corner, you see some of the most complex, challenging uh, areas to manage, like a nuclear power plant, and where you have highly complex processes and very tight coupling of the processes. And those are the environments where you anticipate that failure is more likely to occur. And while what we do isn't quite to that level, it is in that upper right quadrant. Uh, inpatient hospital care, hospital systems in general are thought to be tightly coupled and highly complex. Um, and I would I would uh, put spine surgery in that category as well. And so how, how do we think about managing a circumstance where we know that failure is going to occur? We know that we're going to have issues and complications. There's a, a variety of techniques that we can use in order to mitigate those, um, those challenges. Um, and one of them is to create modularity and to try to create as much simplicity to each part of the task um, that we can. Um, so I'm just gonna go through, I wanna, I wanna be mindful of time. I know that I think there's a lab to follow here. So I'm gonna go a little quickly and we can come back to anything that anyone has any questions on. Um, in the anticipation category, um, remember these are immunocompromised patients with a high risk of, of infection. Um, and there can be um, a greater degree of complexity in managing those post-operative complications depending on um, depending on the types of surgery selected and types of uh, hardware that that's placed. Uh, many times you'll find patients who are um, have experienced significant weight loss, have an increased catabolic state, and are at high risk for a post-operative infection or wound breakdown. Uh, checking a serum albumin, delaying surgery if necessary, pro providing perioperative nutritional support can be critical. Uh, anticipating um, that we're going to use steroids uh, to decrease uh, betogenic edema, um, it can cause um, additional uh, potential complications and morbidity associated with the use of that medication and managing some of the potential side effects of steroid use. Anticipating coagulopathy, um, remembering that we need to make sure that we have adequate um, uh, platelets for the kinds of operations that we're doing. Thrombocytopenia uh, is a common uh, is a common issue. Um, while the numbers I've listed here are fairly arbitrary, they're also reasonably well accepted. 100 uh, platelets of 100 for surgery itself and maintaining several days of 75 thousand uh, subsequently. Um, there are high risks of um, thromboembolic events in patients who have uh, been immobile for an extended period of time, which these, these patients certainly can be. And there are some circumstances where uh, DVT prophylaxis should be considered or even potentially a preoperative filter uh, as appropriate. I know that uh, many institutions will do a um, an ultrasound screen for DVT prior to surgery um, as a as a result, and and I think along the along these lines, it's important for us to remember that we generally hold internal biases as surgeons, where we overestimate the risk of hemorrhage and underestimate the risk of thromboembolic events uh, because of how they how they present and how we deal with them. Uh, hypervascular uh, tumors need to be uh, thought of and managed as well. Uh, there are both primary and metastatic tumors that are more typically hypervascular. Uh, in the metastatic category, renal cell hepatocellular carcinoma, thyroid uh, cancer, pheochromocytoma, and melanoma are the most common, and preoperative embolization can be appropriate um, in, those, uh, in those circumstances. Uh, on the flip side, uh, vascular watershed zones can uh, compromise blood flow to the spinal cord, um, causing, uh, causing uh, the equivalent of a spinal cord stroke, uh, if not managed, if blood pressure is not managed uh, closely. Uh, and then uh, wound management um, is always an issue uh, in these patients, um, avoiding radiated fields if possible, um, coordinating with our radiation oncology colleagues to um, manage how the radiation will be delivered, considering uh, consulting plastic surgery ahead of time um, for closure of uh, complex wounds uh, and to mitigate the risk of wound breakdown. Um, on the team-based based approach uh, side of the equation, um, Often a preoperative indications conference is uh, is incredibly helpful. Um, there are there's more and more data that's available in the organizational behavior literature that supports that multidisciplinary teams, uh, when collaborating, lead to better plan formation and more resilient execution. Um, there's uh, there's an exercise that's been done uh, where uh, participants are 
uh, simulated to have been in a stranded plane survival uh, situation. And uh, uniformly, they do better than even the best per individual performers uh, when collaborating in groups. And so uh, in our multidisciplinary uh, indications conference, we have a variety of, um, uh, of experts who join us and help us to develop uh, uh, comprehensive plans for the treatment of patients. Um, we've also, as many hospitals have, uh, taken a journey uh, with um, HRO principles, high reliability organization principles, um, in order to help to manage uh, some of the other elements. And the, one of the big um, pieces here is to try to flatten the hierarchy, the traditional hierarchy that exists in medicine that prevents individuals who are perceived to be at a lower place on the, on the, um, in the hierarchy from speaking up in times of um, times of uh, challenge. So uh, the surgeon needs to have a diverse skill set, both in the moment um, and as the overall manager of the team. And building that trust uh, really means educating teams around a common language so that when a surgical tech says, um, you know, I have a concern about something, that language means something very specific to me about what that surgical tech is observing or is um, is concerned about. Uh, it's not just a comment they're making. They're specifically choosing that language because they're signaling to me there's something out of the out of the normal that they're that they're witnessing. And in this team-based approach and, and losing these HRO principles, um, it's important for us to remember that a strong manager, a strong CEO of the operating room is working to get more out of the team around them than any of those individuals can get out of themselves. And so is using a variety of tools to help encourage each of those team members to be as high performing as possible uh, in, that, uh, in that moment. Um, there are specific behaviors that we um, encourage our teams. I've, I've listed the CHAMP behaviors from Yale New Haven uh, Hospital here. Um, one, communicating clearly. Uh, two, hand off effectively. Three, attention to detail. Mentoring each other with 200% accountability and practicing a questioning attitude it may not even really matter which specific ones you pick, but um, making sure that they're common to the organization and that everybody knows um, that these are important and recognizing and rewarding individual team members who exemplify these behaviors uh, becomes really important. And then lastly, um, in the sort of ATP framework that I listed at the beginning, uh, relying on processes, not people. So here I've listed our sign-in, time-out, and sign-out procedure. Um, the WHO has a nice one. Many organizations have adopted this, but this is a um, this is a scripted tool that is used that provides structured interaction and communication. And so trying to get away from the idea of just doing timeouts because it's a regulatory requirement, but using that moment as a communication tool to force an interaction between the different team members that provides uh, an additional safety check. Um, things, in, in, and in particular, where I found this valuable is, is having a moment, and certainly not gonna be the only one, but having a specific moment where the surgeon and anesthesiologist discuss specific issues around blood pressure management and, um, and neuromonitoring uh, indications. But this, this, you know, I wrote this, uh, this one for Yale New Haven Hospital, and I can't remember everything on this list. So having this written out and this tool to use, uh, I have found very, very valuable. Um, there are some things that we consider never events, uh, wrong-sided surgery, wrong site surgery, uh, performing the wrong procedure or procedure on the wrong patient, an unintended retention of a foreign object in a patient, um, and, a, and a death in an ASA class one patient, not something we often interact with. Um, but there are Many circumstances, I think, where um, where there's a risk of these things happening. Um, I'm showing in the upper right-hand corner here a, uh, a um, risk of localization of the wrong uh, wrong location and, and and other kinds of uh, challenges that we face um, in managing spine care. Um, so, trying to stay on time, just to to conclude. Um, Normal accident theory suggests that highly complex and tightly coupled systems, such as we see in spine surgery, will have accidents. And our job is to um, predict them, um, help our patients understand that that's a, that's a risk, and then to mitigate the, um, the effects of those, uh, those complications as much as possible. And high reliability organizations appear to have demonstrated a far lower rate of accidents using a combination of systems-based thinking relying on processes, an obsession with failure, a commitment to resilience and outstanding communication with deference to expertise. 
Um, this is a journey and something that uh, many organizations are undertaking, but the principles of which really can, can help us avoid getting into trouble in the first place. And then lastly, uh, I encourage all of the surgeons uh, here to think about not just developing their individual skills or expertise in the operating room and their, their technical abilities and judgment, but also working to anticipate how to manage a complex team with increasingly highly specialized individuals um, from the navigation tech to uh, the, anesthesia, the anesthesia team to the uh, nursing teams and thinking about how we encourage those around us to perform at their um, highest level possible um, and thereby uh, help our patients uh, do better in the long run. So I'll, I'll stop there. I know that uh, there's a lab uh, scheduled to begin shortly and I'm happy to take any questions before, uh, before we take off. Thank you, Max. Great talk. <clears throat> All right. I, if there's no question, Michael, you have any questions?